Let's say you just ate a carbohydrate loaded meal, like a bowl of rice. A few hours after you're done, those carbohydrates are broken down in the small intestine into their simplest chemical form, monosaccharides, the most important of which is glucose, which is a six carbon molecule that's in the shape of a ring. Glucose moves from the small intestine into the bloodstream, and blood glucose levels rise, which causes the pancreas to secrete a hormone called insulin. Insulin makes more glucose enter cells through specific transporters called glutes. Once glucose is in the cell, an enzyme called hexokinase attaches a phosphate group to its sixth carbon, creating glucose 6-phosphate. From there, the cell has the option to take glucose through a metabolic pathway called glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose to generate ATP. But if the cell doesn't need ATP, glucose can be used to make some other useful products by entering an alternative metabolic pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway is named for the products it ultimately generates. Pentose refers to a 5-carbon sugar called ribose, and phosphate refers to a molecule called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, or NADPH. So the pentose phosphate pathway is an alternative pathway that glucose can enter when the cells need to make ribose and NADPH. Ribose can be used to make nucleotides, which are the building blocks of our DNA and RNA. And NADPH is rich in electrons, and can be used in various anabolic pathways. Anabolic pathways are the ones that synthesize molecules like fatty acids, from scratch, and require an electron donor, like NADPH. Just like glycolysis, the pentose phosphate pathway happens exclusively in the cytoplasm, and it does not require any special organelles, which means that all of our cells can use this pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway can be divided into two phases, an irreversible oxidative phase that ultimately yields NADPH, and a reversible non-oxidative phase that yields ribose. Irreversible means that the reaction can only go in one direction, that is, substrate to product. On the other hand, reversible means that the reaction can go in both directions, and the substrate and product can be interconverted into one another, depending on what the body needs more. Oxidation of a molecule means that a molecule donates or loses its electrons, in the form of hydrogens, to another molecule. Okay, so to launch the oxidative phase, an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD, snatches a hydrogen from glucose 6-phosphate and offers it to NADP+, making 6-phosphogluconate and NADPH in the process. This is the rate-limiting step of the pentose phosphate pathway. The rate-limiting step of any reaction is the step that takes the longest to happen, so it's therefore the step that determines the overall rate of the pathway. The next step involves an enzyme called 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase, which, just like G6PD, steals an electron from 6-phosphogluconate and offers it to another NADP+, making our second NADPH. But unlike G6PD, this enzyme also removes a carbon from the 6-carbon 6-phosphogluconate and releases it as carbon dioxide, making a 5-carbon sugar called ribulose 5-phosphate. This marks the end of the oxidative phase, with a total of two NADPH molecules created per glucose. Now, since NADPH is electron-rich, it's time for it to give back to the cellular community. NADPH can donate electrons in anabolic pathways like fatty acid synthesis, as well as steroid hormone synthesis and cholesterol synthesis. So there's usually a lot of NADPH in tissues that make these molecules, like the liver, the adrenal cortex, the gonads, and the milk-producing breast glands. In addition to anabolic pathways, NADPH is also a key player for antioxidant reactions. For example, red blood cells normally produce reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct of oxygen metabolism. Hydrogen peroxide can be harmful, so red blood cells also produce antioxidants like glutathione which can neutralize hydrogen peroxide. In the presence of an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase, glutathione donates electrons to hydrogen peroxide, 
converting it to water, which is harmless. NADPH comes into play as an electron supplier. In the presence of an enzyme called glutathione reductase, NADPH donates its electrons to glutathione so that it can effectively neutralize hydrogen peroxide. So if NADPH wasn't generated by the pentose phosphate pathway, glutathione wouldn't get the electrons it needs, and hydrogen peroxide would accumulate and cause damage to proteins within the cell, eventually leading to cell mm. death. Now let's go back to see what happens to ribulose 5-phosphate during the non-oxidative pathway. Remember that's ribulose, not ribose. The cool aspect about the non-oxidative pathway is that it's pretty flexible and reversible. It can generate different products depending on what the cell needs. Ribulose 5-phosphate initially gets converted to ribose 5-phosphate by an isomerase enzyme. An isomerase simply shuffles the carbons on a molecule into different positions without adding or removing anything, similar to shuffling a deck of cards. Ribose 5-phosphate is important in nucleotide synthesis, which are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. Nucleotides are made up of a 5-carbon sugar, a phosphate backbone, and a purine or pyrimidine nitrogen base. So ribose 5-phosphate serves as that 5-carbon sugar required for DNA or RNA synthesis. Alternatively, ribulose 5-phosphate can be converted into another 5-carbon sugar, called xylulose 5-phosphate, by an enzyme called epimerase. Now let's say that the cell does not need to make DNA or RNA. Here's where the non-oxidative phase gets really playful, with the help of two other enzymes, transketolase and transaldolase. Transketolase removes two carbons from xylulose 5-phosphate and requires vitamin B1, or thiamine, as a cofactor. The two carbons go to ribose 5-phosphate, creating a 7-carbon molecule called cetoheptulose 7-phosphate, as well as a 3-carbon molecule called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now transaldolase comes in and removes three carbons from cetoheptulose 7-phosphate turning it into a 4-carbon molecule called erythrose 4-phosphate. The three carbons go to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, making the 6-carbon fructose 6-phosphate. If there's another xylulose 5-phosphate around, transketolase can jump in and remove two carbons from it, giving them to erythrose 4-phosphate to make another fructose 6-phosphate molecule. So processing three ribulose 5-phosphate molecules can yield one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and two fructose 6-phosphates. Both glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate are intermediate molecules in glycolysis. So even in the middle of the pentose phosphate pathway, the cell can decide to divert toward glycolysis if it needs more energy, and vice versa. If the cell is in the middle of glycolysis, but it realizes it needs to craft some nucleotides instead, transketolase and transaldolase can convert glucose 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate back to ribulose 5-phosphate. Alright, as a quick recap. The pentose phosphate pathway is an alternative metabolic pathway for glucose. It's made up of an oxidative phase, which makes NADPH, and a non-oxidative phase, which makes ribose 5-phosphate. NADPH is an important electron donor and is required by anabolic reactions as well as antioxidant molecules. Ribose 5-phosphate is crucial for making the nucleotides necessary for DNA and RNA synthesis, as well as creating intermediates of glycolysis, like glucose 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. 